This happened a few days ago when my family decided to visit Mexico. They usually visit not only to visit my grandparents, but to also donate unwanted items from our house to the kids that are in desperate need. I don't usually go to Mexico, not because I don't want to, but because of the pets that need sitting as well as our valuables, as our neighborhood is sadly now being targeted by robbers ever since the events of 2020. My parents would urge me to go to Mexico with them, but I kept insisting that I'd stay and boy do I now have another reason why I never want to go back to Mexico. My uncle, who I'll call Rick for privacy reasons, wanted to tag along to see his mom as it's been over a decade since he hadn't paid a visit to Mexico. My stepdad gladly took him along and was willing to go to California just to pick him up and take him. My stepdad took our truck and trailer which was filled to the brim with bikes, clothes and other pieces of furniture. You name it, we have it and we're willing to donate, while my mom wanted to take a plane as my three year old baby sister wouldn't stand a four day drive. I obviously didn't want to go as I needed to watch the cats in our house, despite my mom trying to convince me that she would hire someone to watch the house for us. I would have agreed to go and relax without having to worry about my pets for a bit and let someone do the work for me, but me being me, I don't trust people looking after our stuff after the events of 2020 and other personal events that I will not go into for the purpose of the story. My mom's flight was due a few days after my stepdad's initial journey from our state up north all the way to California and to Mexico. It let my mom prepare for her flight while also telling me what to do around the house and what to do and what not to do. Basically all of the mom things that you hear when you're going to be the man of the house. Two days went by without incident until I walked to the kitchen and spotted a cricket up on the ceiling. A lot of questions popped in my mind like, how did that cricket get up there? Why is it up there? I told my mom and her reaction was not something I would expect. She urged me to kill it and, without question, I got the bug spray and slapped it out of the ceiling with my shoe, making sure it was dead. I didn't understand why my mom wanted me to kill it, let alone have such a shocked reaction. My mom was never scared of bugs. Why was she suddenly terrified by this one little cricket? Two days went by faster than I expected. My mom invited me to go out to eat and talk and to go shopping. I obviously agreed and went out to eat. We had long discussions about our family, friends, etc. I remember sitting back for a moment and remembered the cricket incident. I asked my mom if she remembered the cricket and why she had such a negative reaction towards it. And what she told me next makes me regret asking, but at the same time question my own beliefs and ideology. She told me a story about how a few years ago she also spotted a cricket. She tried to kill it, but much to her dedication escaped her sight. She searched as much as she could trying to find the thing until she had given up and continued on with her day. As a few weeks rolled by, she got a call from my grandma telling her that my grandpa tragically passed away from having a stroke. Let me tell you, hearing my mom cry over a family member is nothing nobody wants to relive. She had a theory about the crickets telling me about how they're warning signs to something tragic, like spotting a crow or a black cat. I was skeptical because I didn't believe in that kind of stuff, but I gave her the benefit of the doubt and we continued on with our day, but little did we know, this day would take a complete 180 for all of us. I was upstairs playing my video games and talking to my girlfriend. I told her I would be right back as I wanted something to drink. I went downstairs and saw that my mom was on the phone with a panic expression. I waited for her to end the call and to ask what happened. Apparently my dad did make it to across the US border, but was stopped by the cartel. For those who don't know, the cartel are the Mexican mafia, responsible for all of the illegal drug trafficking, human smuggling, and murder. When they don't get what they want from someone, they kidnap them and torture them for fun while carving into their skin, leaving behind their signature symbols to put out some message to people telling them to pay their fee or be tortured and killed. My stepdad was held at gunpoint, demanded to pay a fine of $600 per person. My uncle and stepdad didn't have the money which angered the group. They told him to follow them as they were going to take them somewhere. What my stepdad did next was something that still even surprises me. He pretended to follow them only to take a complete 180 from their truck, speeding off the highway almost making them crash into the now busy road. When people want to escape from impending danger, 
They try to look for the earliest way to escape any way possible, even if it might cost them an arm or limb. They got away, but the cartel weren't giving up there. They thankfully didn't follow as they knew that they would be caught as members in public ultimately screwing them over. They went back to the nearest police station trying to have something done about the incident. Instead of sending police out to patrol the area, let alone escort them to a safe place, all they said was, if I were you, I wouldn't have come here to try to solve this. I later then learned that they were in a cartel-owned city, where the police wouldn't bat an eye as the cartel could do whatever they wanted. The cartel basically have the Mexican government at their fingertips, seeing how much they had grown and killed to get to where they are now. My uncle decided to call US government officials like the FBI and the CIA to ask what they can do. Since they were still in Mexican territory, they couldn't do anything unless they traveled back and they would have to do it immediately. They were forced to rush back to the United States as soon as they found out that the cartel members that tried to rob them hired a few guns to kill my stepdad and uncle. The cartel don't take failure so lightly, and they were willing to do whatever it takes to get the job done. They luckily made it back into the US and sure enough, there were agents outside of the borders waiting for them. My mom demanded my stepdad to drive back home, but he couldn't as the cartel members took their money so he was forced to finish the trip. But luckily the agents and Mexican officials from another border area insisted on escorting them to their destination. My mom then told me how, during the entire ordeal, Uncle Rick was on the phone, saying his goodbyes to his wife and kids, thinking that he was going to die. My stepdad had to control himself and I absolutely admire his attitude when he was confronted by the cartel. My mom still went to Mexico via plane, but during her final night at the house, I couldn't help but have a massive mental breakdown as all of the horrific thoughts came through my mind. What if my mom and baby sister were there? What if the hired guns found them and shot them dead like animals? All of these thoughts flooded my mind for the entirety of the night until early in the morning when I took my mom to the airport. We were talking throughout the drive about the situation and how lucky Uncle Rick and Stepdad were. I couldn't agree more, but then the thought of the cricket came into my mind. I reminded her again and she explained how lucky we were to find it and kill it as it possibly prevented another death. My mom made it to Mexico, as well as my stepdad and uncle, who called me the next morning after my mom left to Mexico to tell me that he was fine. Even after all of that had happened, I still asked myself, what if I didn't kill that cricket? I want to know, but at the same time, maybe some things are better left forgotten and buried, never to be heard from again. In other words, I don't think I ever want to find the answer. This was back in November of 2018 and takes place in North Carolina. I was 14 at the time. My family and I had just moved across states. We had just gotten to the city where we planned on living after a long road trip. We were all hungry, so we decided to go grab dinner before we went to pick up the keys to our new house. We went to this local pizza shop. Since we had our dogs with us, because we hadn't moved into our house yet, we decided to eat in the car. I'm a pretty fast eater compared to the rest of my family, so I finished way before them. After I was done, I decided to bring my puppy out to do her business. We were standing just a little ways up from the car, playing in the leaves on the ground. I grew up in Florida, so I wasn't used to seeing piles of autumn leaves. So, I was just living my best life, not paying attention to my surroundings, when a man taps me on my shoulder. My dog notices him and immediately tries to jump on him, as she does with anyone, so I pulled her back while I'm backing away from him. He looks to be in his mid-40s to 50s. He smiles creepily at me like it was forced. He says in his scruffy southern voice, You have my dog, my border collie. Immediately a red flag goes off in my mind, as my dog looks very obviously like a boxer and nothing like a border collie. Now let me tell you, I'm horrible at confrontations, so I just say nervously, I think you're mistaken, sir, this is my dog. Not even telling him how my dog does not look anything like what he's describing. I look over to my parents' car that was just a couple of feet behind me, unsure of what to do. They hadn't even noticed the man approach me, and they were on their phones. The man now asked me, 
Well, would you be able to come help me look for my dog? I can feel my stomach drop in that moment. I still don't want to make a scene as I'm probably overreacting, but I have read my fair share of kidnapping and human trafficking horror stories, so I have an idea in the back of my mind on what's going down. He then says something along the lines of, I got some money in the back of my truck for you. If I went with him, and my hands are sweating at this point, this is something straight out of a Reddit thread. He points over to a very sketchy, rundown looking truck. I tell him I'm busy and have to go, but best of luck to finding his dog, still trying to keep him on my good side. Looking back on it now, I don't know why I didn't tell him my parents were right there. If I would have, I think he would have just backed off right then. I overly worry about what others think, so I was just trying to be polite and not make him mad. He then decides to grab my dog's leash and says that he had dog treats at his truck and starts to walk away with my dog. I pull my leash away from him and say sternly, I gotta go now. As I start walking away, he then grabs my wrists and rips the leash out of my hands, throwing it to the ground. He starts pulling me with him, mumbling something like, Just come see what I have for you. My dog, the sweet good girl she is, follows after us and starts barking. While he starts to drag me with him, and I'm pretty small, five foot four, and have no upper body strength whatsoever, so I just start screaming to let go of me. My parents, alarmed hearing me scream and our dog chasing after me barking, see this man pulling their daughter against her will. They immediately start sprinting after me. I start screaming, Mom and Dad. I think he got alarmed when he heard me yell out. As she starts running towards us, the sudden realization that my parents were right there in their car the whole time, he makes a run for it and we didn't run after him. My parents were just glad that they had me. This is definitely not a good way to start off our new life in North Carolina. Not even having lived there a day yet. I don't wish this to ever happen to anyone as it was absolutely terrifying. But my advice for you is, don't be afraid to use your words. Even if they offend the person. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington near Mount Rainier, like not an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night I wake up and hear something, open my tent, and there was a guy sitting by where my fire had been right outside my tent. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude just sitting there a couple of feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything with him, just a guy. He saw me open the tent, his eyes got huge like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly but over the next day I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well after writing it off as just some odd occurrence and a guy that was probably high or something and had somehow managed to set up a camp coincidentally not far from mine. Then two days after that and 10 to 15 miles away in the totally random directions that Nobody could take the same path as on accident. I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises that I got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them and out of the darkness, someone was like, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said, No. I don't even think that's a real place. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight, but they yelled, Aim that way! And kind of spooked and not wanting to anger them, a potentially crazy person, I did as they said. After like 15 minutes of me being very freaked out and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer, so I shined my light that way again. And it was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. He had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days because... There is no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as that wilderness is. No possible way. As soon as my light hit him, he took off again. I started to chase him, but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness in the dark, so stopped quickly after probably only 100 to 200 feet. This one couldn't be written off, because the only way he could have been in both places is specifically if he was following me. 
I decided the trip was over the very first thing in the morning and hiked back over the three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone who was following off my trail, and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me. I really can't describe how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid potentially being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, twice I heard what sounded like a person walking circles outside of my tent, but by the time I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but slowly decided sounded more like a human making animal calls, but could have actually been an animal, but I didn't actually see the guy again. But it really sounded like a person making howling noises. I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, probably the most terrifying experience I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were, and no way of getting an explanation but I really can't articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. I go for a short run every night right after sundown when it's finally cool out. I always take the exact same route, a loop through a quiet and sparsely populated neighborhood, and I now realize how easy of a target that made me. A short section of the route passes by an unlit park. A couple of weeks ago, I'd seen a guy hanging out behind a truck that was parked next to the entrance, and it was so unusual to see someone else there that I decided to be extra cautious, turn around, and head back home. I didn't get close enough to get a good look at his face. A few days later, I saw what looked like the same guy by the park again. I figured I was probably just being paranoid, but I decided to turn around again just in case. I hadn't noticed any activity by the park in the last several days, so I resumed my normal route and didn't even think about that guy that I'd seen up there. Then last night, as I was passing by the park, I had this inexplicable feeling that I was being watched. I couldn't spot anyone nearby, but the park extends into pitch black darkness, so someone could easily hide there unseen. I decided just to keep running, look confident, and try to hurry past the park as quickly as I could. Suddenly, I smelled a strong wave of cologne in the air. That immediately put me on edge, and I'm pretty grateful that he was wearing it so it tipped me off. After I smelled it, I had no doubt in my mind that there was somebody nearby. But still, I didn't see any movements in front or on either side of me, and I was afraid to turn around. Immediately past the park, there's a bend in the road. There's a house in the corner as you turn down the road. The house has lots of tall bushes in the front yard. I normally run right past those without even thinking of it, but since my gut instinct was blaring like a siren, I quickly moved to the middle of the street as I rounded the corner. I shot a glance behind me to see if anyone had actually been nearby. I saw a man slowly walking through the front yard of the house on the corner, looking toward me. He paused behind the bushes as if trying to remain hidden. I could see his jeans and a pair of black and white sneakers, but little else. His slow footsteps were so creepy that I can't get the image out of my mind, as if he was trying to be as quiet as he could, like a cat stalking its prey. If I hadn't made the split decision to run into the middle of the street and away from the yard, I would have been within grabbing distance. I don't know how I acted so quickly, thanks to adrenaline. I turned on the flashlight on my phone, aimed it right at the bushes, hoping it startled or blinded him long enough for me to get some distance between us, and started sprinting full speed down the road. It was probably the fastest I'd run in my life. At the end of each block, I glanced behind me to check if the man was there. Fortunately, I lost sight of him. If he'd decided to sprint after me, I'm not sure what I would have done. From what I could make out, this guy was at least a foot taller than me. By the time I got home, the adrenaline had dissipated and I was shaking with fear. I couldn't sleep at all last night. What scares me the most about the whole thing is that I'm 99% sure this was the same guy I'd seen hanging out in front of the park recently, and now I can't shake the idea that he'd been watching me and calculating the right time and path to try and sneak up behind me. He knew that I always ran past there around the same time. The thought that he was probably watching me from the darkness in the park last night before quietly moving out of it and starting to follow me makes me sick. Needless to say, 
I won't be running past that park at night anymore, or running alone at night, period. The terror I felt when I turned around and saw the guy's shoes slowly moving behind the bushes and his head facing me is like nothing else I'd ever felt before. I live in a small town, the kind where almost everyone knows each other, and it also really creeps me out to think that this might have been someone I'd seen around town in the past. Part of me wishes I've gotten a better look at his face for the police report. Another part is glad I didn't, since that image would no doubt haunt me. While I was in college, I dated a guy for a little over two years. He was a jealous person, but I didn't notice it as a red flag till later on in the relationship because he would distract from it by showing me off. Once we were going to different schools, despite living together, he really upped the red flags. Things like insisting he would go through my phone, not letting me go to a funeral for a friend's grandfather because he thought it was sketchy, and literally stopping me from ever going out or drinking other than my 21st birthday. Yeah, he was a psycho. He was also into some questionable things in the bedroom that made me uncomfortable with what his true dark fantasies might be. Unfortunately, I found out that in the bedroom he had some pretty violent fantasies, and that was a turn-on for him. At that point, I started trying to kick him out. I finally got a chance a few weeks later when I caught him in a lie. He wasn't home, so I packed literally everything of his and put it on the porch, locked the door to the porch, and locked the security lock on the door so he couldn't come back. I only saw him to get my keys back and let him get his TV. Luckily, I had him taken off of the lease immediately because I got a call that he was claiming he didn't have his key and wanted to be let in. Again, crazy. I had my locks changed and moved on. I soon learned that he cheated on me, which wasn't a surprise and I didn't care at that point. I used it as a reason to make him shut up as he texted and called over and over. He broke his phone over the ordeal, got a new number and began texting me again. I wasn't strong enough to block his number but I did ignore him and block him on social media. Well, I started dating my next boyfriend and my ex was still being obsessive and possessive. They knew each other so my boyfriend would park in a different part of the apartment complex in case my ex was creeping and tried to do some damage. Well. He was creeping. My particular building faced the fence that lined the shops in front of the complex, so cars would drive by, people would walk by, etc. Totally normal. However, my ex could sit there, and would, in perfect view of anyone who came to my unit or if I left because I was in a corner unit. To see him there was terrifying because I couldn't do anything about him sitting in a public place. He hadn't threatened me, and the assault that he had performed would not have been believed in that college town. My boyfriend had to threaten him multiple times, actually made him cry, which was fine with me. My ex would stop for a week and then just pick back up. He would text me and say he's in the complex and ask if he can come over. God, no. He had made acquaintances with this guy in the complex just to have a way in in case he wanted it. I moved to the city about an hour and a half away around five months after our breakup. Unfortunately, I live in a very unsafe place because I was broke and making practically nothing on my first job. We were talking shootings, daily carjackings, being followed to your car, and things like that. I never posted anything about my job or location in case he had a burner account following one of my accounts. He had a girlfriend but would text me saying, I'll break up with her just to get lunch with you. He made the number for all his text receipts my cell phone number so... I always got texts about when he took an Uber or went out to dinner. I went off on him one drunken night about that. I did believe that there was no way he could find me despite the lack of safety at my new apartment. But one day I saw a very specific car, identical to his friends who had a custom paint job and wheels. I know this because I had to listen to all that nonsense all the time when we were dating. He was one of those guys that would have banged his car if he could. The car just sat there further up the parking deck than I was going to walk. I couldn't tell if anyone was in it. I quickly went back into the hallway and made a bunch of turns in the confusing maze that was my complex. I hope I was just being paranoid, but I can't know for sure. To catch up with the present, it's been over three and a half years since I broke up with him. He knows I'm single, and he's relentless. 
He'll message me different ways on different social media accounts. He found my PayPal account and sent me money to try to get me to talk to him. He sends me messages about what he wants to do with me in unsolicited pictures. He disgusts me. I truly hope life does him as dirty as he has done to me. The only times he's really left me alone is when he had a crazy girlfriend who said she hopes I get COVID and die or die during spine surgery or when he thought that I was engaged. If he thinks I'm single, he'll go after me. He knows I live in the city. I think he saw them on my Instagram when it wasn't private before. He will send me messages saying he'll be driving through the city and wants to see me, offers to solicit me, and thinks that there's something wrong with me the few times I do respond and I tell him to screw off. I've just blocked him again, but I won't underestimate the determination of a stalker. A few winters ago, I worked security for a company that was in the process of converting an abandoned warehouse into one that was up to par for modern day work. This was a pretty tedious task. The warehouse had been abandoned since the 80s and the decades had not been kind. The plants had not overtaken the building as it was well within a concrete jungle but it was still far enough off the beaten path that it had attracted a number of residents who had not been kind to it. Most of the copper that wasn't bolted down or just too difficult to reach had been stolen, so all the wiring had to be redone. The windows had cracked, the ceiling had leaked in places, you get the idea. In truth, part of me wondered if it wouldn't have been easier just to tear the place down and rebuild. The earlier days of the job were largely uneventful. The squatters and random urban explorers quickly caught on to the fact that the building was being renovated. A chain link fence topped with barbed wire was up around most of the construction equipment, new locks were placed in the doors, and there were various security installments to deter anyone from trying to make off with exposed equipment or materials. You know those motion sensing lights that people place outside their homes to deter burglars? We had a sort of enhanced version of those. They would flood an area with this bright, almost sickly green light but it was blinding to whoever was caught in it. We also had a silent alarm that would sound if it were triggered, and as a final failsafe, a deafening alarm could be pulled by security in conjunction with it. For some relevant context, there was one largely unsupervised entrance into the building. A series of maintenance access corridors spanned through the walls, and these could mostly only be entered from inside, but there was one external entrance. There was a sort of unloading area that adjoined to the basement of the building. Trucks could drive down a ramp into a tunnel and enter this area, and along the side of the tunnel there was one entrance into the maintenance access corridors. Most of the employees weren't aware the store existed, as it now served precious little purpose. Hell, I only knew of it because it was pointed out to me by some of the renovators. That tunnel in the adjoining area would likely be the last place to be touched and in all honesty, I wasn't even sure it was going to be as I didn't know if the current company intended to make use of it. The door wasn't in plain sight, it was behind a guardrail, and it went up into the building at a sort of angle that made it difficult to see unless you were facing it from a certain direction. It would be entirely possible to walk or drive right past it and never know it existed. It was an imposing, albeit unassuming, old steel door. The hinges themselves had some rust on them, but the door was in mostly good shape. It was dark in color, though it didn't seem to be painted. The handle was stainless steel and had aged the best of all from the door. This is the one giveaway of the door's existence. If you were in the tunnel and it was dark enough, a flashlight or natural lighting would glint off of the handle, indicating it was there. This door was kept locked for obvious reasons, but it was easy to forget that it was there. We never patrolled the maintenance access corridors as part of the security routine. It was generally assumed to even get inside of them, an intruder would have to trip the alarm well before even being able to enter those, and it wasn't entirely safe. There were exposed wires, and those corridors were extremely claustrophobic, not to mention that once you were in them, you had to know where the exits were or you'd be wandering around lost for quite a while. Moreover, some of the exits no longer worked, or at least weren't operational for now due to the ongoing construction. This brings us to December 22nd. It was one of the worst sort of winter nights. It was cold and it was raining, 
but it was just warm enough that we'd be pelted with freezing rain and denied snow. The wind didn't quite howl, but it had an eerie moan as it passed by the warehouse. At that time of the year, it got dark at around 6 or so, so by midnight it was nearly pitch black outside. The storm just added to this. It had been a particularly boring night. The lull of rain and constant hum of yellow fluorescent lights had me rather sleepy. I had tried reading the past the time. There wasn't any Wi-Fi and phone reception was rather poor, but I couldn't make myself focus. I considered sleeping, but I had this weird gut feeling that I needed to stay awake. I wasn't afraid and I didn't feel like I was being watched or anything like that. It's hard to explain. But I just had this sense that I could nap later, but I needed to wait up a bit just to be sure it'd be appropriate. I didn't want my boss reviewing the footage and thinking I had gone to sleep too early, I suppose, but I don't feel like that was quite what I was thinking at the time. So it was with lidded eyes and a nodding head that I heard a click from somewhere within the facility. At first my mind didn't even register it. I just let it be the background noise and then I realized it wasn't that. It was an abnormal sound. At once I was wide awake and immediately looked at my surroundings. Nothing had fallen and nothing was out of place. I was almost tempted to shrug off as an uh, electrical issue but it just didn't sit right with me. I had been there long enough to know that I knew more or less what the building sounded like and that wasn't a noise that I'd heard before. I decided that I'd go do a routine patrol, nothing fancy, and make sure the doors were still locked and that would be enough. As I left the rudimentary security posts, which was really a desk surrounded by filing cabinets, I began to feel a sense of unease creeping into my spine. I couldn't quite place what it was. But the further I got from my vantage point which allowed me to see most of the main floor, the less safe I felt. I felt exposed. Vulnerable. Every step I took made me want to retreat back to my desk. I shook it off. I told myself I was being silly. Heck, I chased off homeless people before. It wouldn't be any different if that's what it was. The self-reassurance didn't work. This felt different somehow. I went door to door and each of them was locked as it was supposed to be. Seeing this made me feel a little bit better and by the time I had visited the final door, I was mostly able to shove the burgeoning dread out of my mind. I was satisfied with the inspection and figured the sound must have been from the storm somehow. It didn't make sense, but it was the only thing that I could figure at the time. I shrugged it off and began to walk back to the desk. I had almost made it to my seat when I heard a sound that sent a chill down my spine. It was a distinct rattling sound, as though someone was rattling a doorknob somewhere within the facility. I froze and I listened. The sound continued only for an instant and then there was a gentle but distinct thud. Someone had tried to push their weight against a door and it held. My first instinct was to check my paper and see if the silent alarm had been tripped. To my surprise and confusion, it hadn't. I frowned. I would write it off as a wayward bat thrashing about in the rafters, but the sound had seemingly come from against an outside wall, and a bat wouldn't be able to rattle a doorknob. I remained still for a moment. I listened for something, anything, but all I could hear was the rain against the rooftop the wind and the din of cheap warehouse lighting. I sighed through my nose. The fear had given way to a feeling of annoyance now. I started the long walk across the concrete floor to check the doors once again and then I remembered it. The outside door. The click. Someone was in the maintenance corridors. My heart rate immediately picked up. That feeling of unease had given way to near terror. My first instinct was to trip the loud alarm, but for some reason, I couldn't bring myself to do it. If the person didn't know that I was in the building, it had tipped them off. It was possible that they were lost and trapped in the corridors, for now, but if they got out. I set off the silent alarm instead. I knew I was going to have to go into the corridors, but this was extremely unsettling. I was going to have to hope I came in behind the person and that I was the one stalking them not the other way around. I quietly walked over to the nearest door, a tiny metal frame with a glass window that allowed one to see inside and peered into the corridor. It was virtually pitch black. 
I looked to the left and to the right. The right led to a sort of junction before hitting a corner of the building and the left was a long, empty corridor. I slowly opened the door, letting it gently shut behind me and flicked on my flashlight. This corridor was empty. I went to the right first. I figured that if the intruder came down the left corridor, I would have ample time to react, but I didn't want to be caught by surprise by him rounding the corner. As I reached the turn, however, I hesitated. I was utterly terrified that I would round the corner and be face to face with the intruder. I could almost feel their eyes on me. I even took a step backwards. I listened. No footsteps. No breathing. Nothing. I bit my bottom lip and rounded the corner and was greeted by an equally empty corridor. This one didn't run as far. I was relieved. I began making slow, deliberate steps down the corridor, careful not to trip over wiring and pipes, and would stop every so often to listen. It was still silent, eerily so. I had made it about halfway down the corridor when I heard a doorknob rattle again. It was hard to ascertain how close I was to it now, as the sound echoed down the hallways. I froze. The rattling continued before it was followed by a heavy bang. They weren't being subtle anymore. They had slammed into the door. I wasn't sure if they were even in the corridor anymore and decided now was the best time to turn back. The police had to be here soon. I would just go back to my desk and wait it out. That's what I should have done from the beginning. Entering the maze was a mistake. I rounded the corner to get back to the door where I had entered and as my flashlight fell in the corridor, I almost missed it. Almost. The light illuminated a silhouette at the end of the hall. There was a man, or what I assumed to be a man, standing still at the end of my flashlight's beam. He was tall, extremely so. He was every bit of six foot six inches, and he wasn't the lanky type, if anything. He seemed somewhat overweight and was a bit hunched over in the narrow confines of the corridor. He seemed to have his head angled down a bit, and he was wearing all black. We both stood there for a moment, motionless. I was paralyzed with fear. I can't say what it was about him, but he just felt wrong. This didn't seem like a squatter seeking shelter. I can't explain it, but I knew that he had malicious intent. Trying to hide the shakiness in my voice, I summoned the scariest tone I could muster and shouted out, Security! Freeze! He didn't move for a moment. I began walking toward him, fully intending to exit through the door in which I'd entered and locking him in the chamber, and he started barreling towards me. I mean a full-on sprint. He was faster than I expected, faster than he should have been, and the footsteps echoed in the corridor. I instinctively bolted for the door, but I shouldn't have. It made him rapidly draw closer to me. As I ran for the door, I could hear his staggered breathing as he drew nearer and nearer. He beat me to the door. He knew that's where I was headed, and he stopped and waited for me. I froze once again. I wasn't able to hide that my hands were shaking. The flashlight beam thrashed wildly about the corridor. He seemed even larger up close. He stared down at me with inky black eyes. The man was probably in his mid-forties, but it was hard to tell. He had long gray hair and similarly gray stubble, and his face was eaten up with what looked like pockmarks. He had water dripping off of his black clothes, and the top of his head was covered with a black beanie. He smiled a wide, toothy grin at me and took a step closer. I wanted to run, but he knew that the nearest doors were locked, and it was pointless. Don't come any closer, I demanded. He took another step, and then another, and he was now uncomfortably close to me. He had that rancid, sticky sweet smell that rotting meat has topped with cigarette smoke. He leaned down a bit to be directly in my face, and I caught a hint of peppermint and alcohol in his breath. He reached a gloved hand towards me and placed it on my shoulder, and he spoke with this childlike voice. It was falsely high-pitched and sounded like a voice that a kindergarten-aged child would use to taunt one of their friends. This came over his naturally gritty baritone and years of being a hard smoker. Tag, you're it. 
He kept his hand on my shoulder and just stared at me, grinning for what felt like an hour, and then he slowly turned around and bolted back down the corridor, laughing with this horrible laugh as he sprinted into the dark. I didn't move. I couldn't move. I waited until I heard the footsteps and demonic laugh grow quieter and quieter, and when I was sure he was far enough away, I ran for the door, nearly fell out of it, forced it shut and locked it behind me. I then sprinted across the concrete floor to the main entrance and sounded the noise alarm and ran outside into the rain. I stood outside, back against the wall of the building, panting for breath. I couldn't even feel the cold. I didn't feel the cold until I heard the sirens. I was numb when the police walked past me. I was able to talk, but it felt like my body was on autopilot and I was watching from outside of it. They combed the entire building, corridors included, but they didn't find anyone. They did, however, find that the door to the maintenance access from the tunnel was open. They also found a large butcher knife, a half-drank bottle of bottom-shelf vodka, and a sheet of notebook paper with a smiley face drawn on it between the door and the guardrail. I still am to this day a practicing pagan, but when I was younger, I was inexperienced and stupid. I was 14 and suffering from terrible insomnia, so I would often stay up late listening to astral projection meditation videos on YouTube to see if I could astral project. For those who don't know, this is the practice of having one's soul leave one's body for a period of time to travel around the world or even possibly visit other realms. It was a Wednesday night and I was up exceptionally late in my bed listening to a meditation video, but I couldn't manage to get comfortable or relaxed enough to meditate. I paused my video after enough trial and error and decided it may be best to attempt to sleep. After putting my phone away, I remember looking into the darkness in my room, the lighting from the street lights outside hitting my walls and slightly lighting the dim room. I usually felt quite comfortable in my room, but this night felt unusually eerie. My door to my bedroom was almost shut, the light from the bathroom in the hall just shining out from the door enough to catch my eye as I felt my wariness settle in. Suddenly the darkness behind my bedroom door began to grow and move closer, and closer towards my bed across from the room. My eyes grew huge but I was frozen, too scared to move. The black form walked closer until he was only a few feet away and I attempted to scream but couldn't open my mouth. As I tried to force a scream out, he smiled, more like a disgusting grin, but I saw the light from the door glint against his demented face. His mouth took up his entire face. No eyes, no nose, just a large, grinning, sharp mouth. He stepped closer, his smile only growing as he grew closer and closer. It was up against my face, maybe only a few inches away. I couldn't move, scream, or even blink. He pushed his hands against my arms. I could only feel a cold pressure, but I wanted to scream in agony. What was this thing? All I could do was look directly in his razor-sharp teeth. They didn't look like normal teeth. They were pointed and silver, almost like actual razor blades, and they filled his mouth all the way to the back of his throat. He smiled wider, his mouth a gaping hole of razors and hot, moist, foul-smelling breath. The odor was similar to rotting flesh and sulfur. I choked on the hot stench and suddenly his mouth burst open with a horrendous ripping sound like I'd never heard and maggots came pouring out of the gaping toothy hole where his mouth was. His flesh disintegrated into maggots, bits of black writhing shadow turning into hundreds of white maggots flailing against my body. I screamed, jumped out of bed and ran into the light turning it on while continuing to scream bloody murder as my sister woke up confused and likely terrified. I turned around to see nothing but my younger sister, now annoyed that I had woken her up. I told her it was simply a nightmare and to go back to sleep. I turned the lights back off, grabbed my pillows and blankets and stayed up in the living room with the TV on for the rest of the night, worrying if the thing would come back, if I had hallucinated or if it was really a dream. I had sworn that I hadn't fallen asleep. My phone was paused and where I had placed it before attempting to sleep, but there were no maggots, no black shadows, 
nothing. The next morning I told my sister what had happened, and she told me she had sworn I was asleep when she went to use the restroom earlier in the night, but I had remembered being awake, just after setting my phone down and watching her while she crept back in the room and left that door ever so slightly open. I've shared a brief and summarized version of this encounter on another sub. For reference, I'm a male in my late 20s and live in the UK, and the following happened when I was around 15 or so in a place called Surrey, England. My dad ran a financial sales call center, and my mother was a senior executive at her firm, so between them, they were very rarely home, which left me alone 90% of the time, which was absolutely fine with the 15-year-old me. It gave me plenty of opportunities to game, spend time with friends, watch South Park, and just be a teenager in general. Close to my 15th birthday, my parents decided to build an extension on the property to make it more in keeping with the other properties on our road, and in turn boost the resale value. The properties were all mock Georgian and built in the early 90s in what used to be farmland. It's also key for me to mention, although we never had any paranormal activity prior to the renovations, there was a feeling of dread and anxiety that would wash over me within the house from time to time, as well as the feeling of being watched. I never mentioned this to anyone, but had several friends and other family members mention they felt this way, and years later, so did my own mother, who was pretty anti-paranormal by all accounts. At first, small things would happen, like unexplained noises when it was just me in the home. For example, there would often be random bangs and dragging noises along the hardwood floor in the TV room, and when I go to investigate, there would be nothing. I'd also hear footsteps moving along the ground floor hallway to the kitchen before hearing more banging, like someone was punching the wall as they went along. Things would often go missing only to reappear in a random place later. One of the most notable examples of this was with my dad, who put his car keys on the kitchen island. I was a witness to this, only for them to disappear when we both had our backs to it. We searched everywhere, including the fridge, only to find them in the evening in the fridge where we had already checked. We also had two of the renovation team refuse to finish the work on the house, only to say, there's something not right about your house, mate, to my dad. When checking with the other members of the construction team, they informed my dad that the two guys had both independently of each other saw a figure staring at them in the kitchen that was pure black. I only found out about this three years ago. Things only got worse after the renovations finished. I began hearing footsteps pacing the hallway outside my room at all hours of the night when it was just me at home and that's when the breathing started. I'd be lying in bed trying to fall asleep when breathing, progressively getting louder would emanate from the far left corner of the room. If you can imagine the room being in a square shape, the head of the bed being against the bottom side of the square, my door being on the top right hand side of the square, the breathing would always come from the far left corner and would happen every night until I eventually told my parents about it. They told me to just brush it off, and for the next two nights it didn't happen, only to reoccur consistently and close to my bed once again. I can only explain the feeling it gave off as pure hate. The strangest thing, though, that ever happened in the house was when I heard my mother call my name repeatedly from upstairs. The only problem was that my mother was hundreds of miles away visiting family, and once again, I was home alone as my dad was away with work. The voice started off normal, but as it repeated itself, it grew more and more synthesized, almost like someone or something was trying to do a very good impression of my mother's voice, but falling further and further away from the mark. In the end, it had almost a robotic tone and grew monotonous, but with the same intonation as my mother. This freaked me out to such an extent that I left the house then and there and spent the time with a friend a few good hours away, only to return around 11 p.m. or so. I got into bed, still wary, and I'd say within half an hour of lying there, the door opened slowly and a figure walked into the doorway. It was my mum, though she didn't look right. The moonlight through the window illuminated her face and it just all seemed wrong, almost blurry, but her eyes were completely and utterly wrong. 
They seemed inhuman, and I can still feel and remember the terror. I've got goosebumps just writing this. She mouthed something, which to this day I can't work out, and then backed out of the doorway and into the hall, in reverse, as if someone had hit rewind. I'd just like to assure everyone that I don't drink or do drugs and certainly didn't as a 15-year-old. I have not really discussed any of these things in person for fear of being labeled mental, and to be quite honest, for a long time I did put things down to me maybe going through a, some kind of psychotic episode, but mental illness doesn't run in my family, and nothing like this has ever happened to me elsewhere. I have also had other family members, such as my uncle, share his experience with the house, Apparently when he came over to feed our cat when we were on holiday, he saw a figure peek around the corner of the kitchen, only to swiftly move out of view before footsteps banged up the corridor. Thinking it was an intruder, he followed, but no one was there and the house was freezing. It had dropped temperature extremely rapidly. My dad also had terrible sleep paralysis and nightmares after the renovations, something he hasn't had before or since living at that house. He also heard a woman shouting incoherently in one of the new bathrooms and a man's voice say, Victim, in the kitchen when no other men were in the house. Luckily for me, we moved out when I was 16, and I've never had anything like that happen since. About five years ago, me and my older sister went to a nature park, a wetland so to speak. Of course we went at night so we could skateboard around because you aren't allowed to, but you know, a 14 year old trying to look cool in front of her 24 year old sister. Well we went just around as the sun was setting. For a little bit we got lost since the park was so huge and condensed with the thick woods. We were trying to find the bridge, a 20 foot or so bridge so we can hang out just above the rushing water. By the time we got there, the sun was hardly visible over the mountains. I looked around after drinking my water, and here's where the creepy stuff happened. As I looked on the other side of the bridge, I saw a tall, skinny figure. I first shrugged it off like it was a person, maybe a ranger of the park, but then it got on all fours and walked away. I didn't say anything at first, mainly because I thought it was maybe a bear. I looked back at my sister as we chatted about boys, along with many other things, then I looked back at the bridge. My sister did too, and we both saw the figure this time. At this point, I was totally freaked out. Mind you, it's still not dark out. The sky was purple and orange, so it wasn't like we were seeing things like when your mind pictures figures in the dark. No, it was right there and getting closer. I told my sister to get out of there. Her first going off the bridge and down the hill. I went second. And as I turned to look at the bridge again, it was five feet in front of me on all fours once again. It stood there as me and my sister skated off, and this isn't even the end. I told my sister to head to the main building since there is cameras and lots of light. We skateboarded for what seemed like hours, and every minute seemed to last an eternity. As we finally get to the main building, we finally stopped riding our boards. Out of breath and scared, we both looked around. By this time, it was pitch black outside. We made a mad dash for the car, taking a path that we'd never seen before, but it was outside the park which made us feel even safer. After we got to my sister's jeep, we both got in, hearts racing and scared out of our minds, and when we tried to leave the gate, it was locked, meaning we couldn't leave since there was only one way in and out of the park. We became even more terrified, and we tried everything to get out. We even thought about just leaving the car behind and walking the two hours home, but we drove on to the sidewalk and got out of the park. To this day, I won't go back to those wetlands ever again, even in daylight. Whatever that thing was, I never want to see it again, and I can't stop thinking about it. You can think that this is just a story, but it really did happen. Me and my sister don't even talk about it to this day. Something changed between us. I could feel it after that day. My grandmother, let's call her Amanda for privacy reasons, was a very naughty and mischievous child. She was the naughtiest of all her siblings. She lived in an apartment complex which had a lobby and many passages that connected to other apartments, 
is very similar to the layout of most hostels. She had quite a few friends at the time and was familiar and friendly with everybody, but she was quite fond of an Asian couple, Brandon and Lisa, that lived there as they always used to entertain her and give her treats. There was nothing shady about this couple. Now a few days later, we got this news about the death of Brandon due to a heart attack. His wife was grief-stricken and did nothing else but cry. My grandmother as a little child didn't understand why the once optimistic and kind Asian lady turned into a gloomy woman. Well now, like all children, my grandmother poked her nose into the matter. She was pleading her mother to let her go to their house as she wanted to know what happened. A few hours later, she got out of the house saying that she wanted to go play with some of her friends. Instead, she darted to the house of the couple with two or three of those friends. As she entered the apartment, she could feel the sadness and the grief of the woman. She felt sad about his death and stepped outside the apartment along with her little friends. Suddenly, they hear something out of the blue. The growling of dogs. From the way she described it, she says those growls didn't sound like the growling of small dogs instead of a rather large one, the type you see in a record book. The children got confused and it clicked in her that the landlord didn't allow any kind of pets of any kind. She could hear the growling getting louder and louder. Then there was silence in the passageway for a few seconds, then silence was followed by rather large barks. The only thing my grandma could think of was to run. She ran as fast as her legs could take her. She looked back to see if the thing chasing her had gotten any closer and she saw nothing. A minute or so later, she felt as if though the thing chasing her had caught up to her and was right behind her. Again, she turned around and nothing. But this didn't make her stop. It was at that moment that she tripped on a loose tile. She couldn't get up immediately as she hurt her knee and ankle, and she dreaded for the worst. A few seconds later, she noticed that even though she knew something was chasing them, she couldn't see them and felt a strong gush of air on her face. The barking sounds had now passed her, and the sounds grew fainter and fainter. She had no idea about what was chasing her, and hoped to never hear those terrible sounds again. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official and give and receive feedback from the community, and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join my Discord to interact with me and other listeners directly. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast, where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio. Thanks so much, friends, and remember, always stay mischievous.